Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Elise Anderson. In our show this time, we'll attend a talk on ancient education by visiting Professor Rafaela Cribiori at the Art Auditorium at UH Manoa. She's a professor of classics at NYU. Her talk was called An Ancient Egyptian Schoolhouse, Studying Greek in an Egyptian Oasis. Professor Cribiori is from Milan. After taking a Laurea Magna Cum Laude from the Università del Sacro Quarry, she came to New York. In 1993, she took a PhD in classics from Columbia University, where she taught and curated the collection of Greek and Coptic papyri. She moved to NYU in 2008, and in 2010, she presented the prestigious Townsend Lectures at Cornell. Dr. Cribiori is a specialist in ancient education from the 4th century BCE to the 4th century CE. She is a literary papyrologist and spends a month every year at Dakla Oasis, an NYU excavation in Egypt where an ancient school of higher education was found. Dr. Cribiori has been studying the literary papyri in two oases in Egypt and researching questions of ancient literacy. She's also interested in Greek rhetoric. Her research is centered on late antiquity rhetoric in the 4th century. In an excavation in the Dakla Oasis, NYU found a 4th century residence that belonged to Serenos, a city councilor in that time. Next to Serenos' home was a school. He annexed the school to his home, and his sons and their classmates studied grammar and rhetoric. In one room, a text that exhorted students to learn rhetoric was found. In another room, texts on the wall had verses from Homer and Plutarch. These discoveries are important because so few schools have been found from the Greek and Roman worlds. The talk was organized by Dr. Robert Lippmann, a professor of classics and director of the Tel Tamai excavation being done by the University of Hawaii in Egypt. Tonight we're going to find out that people have been teaching ancient Greek a long time. Uh, even in Egypt. I'd like to just share a personal uh, recollection of uh, my time at, at uh, Columbia and meeting Rafaela. So I, I, I've, I met Rafaela probably decades ago, <laughs> a couple of decades ago, it's hard to believe, um, when I was a graduate student. At that time at Columbia, one of the, um, the uh, courses that we were expected to take was a course as a seminar in papyrology. Um, and Raffaello was a fixture in the rare books room on the sixth floor of Butler Library. And I remember very clearly that the papyri room was kind of like a cage in the seminar with a big seminar table and there were shelves of books lining the space like a, a sanctum uh, in the rare books room the rarest of the books were these papyrological fragments and and so we had to be very careful when we were uh, look examining these specimens of ancient books Raffaella had this ability um, to extract fragments of papyri that were published in volumes all over the place in the library. The papyri are never really fully uh, filled out texts. There are scraps of text, so it takes a very um, incredible memory and mind in order to keep track of all of these different important seemingly unimportant, but actually very important scraps. From 1994 to 2008, Raffaella was the curator of papyri, and she was also an adjunct professor at, in classics at Columbia. In 2001, uh, she helped to pilot an important NEH-funded project called APIS, of course, it had to be APIS. The acronym is the Advanced Papyrological Information System. This was a pioneering effort to make available the images and the um, translations of actual papyri on the internet. And I remember uh, when I had come to Hawaii where there's no papyri here for me to work on, it seemed like a gold mine, a treasure, to have these uh, scanned papyri available on the internet. Since then, the APIS project has gone dormant and it's been absorbed into another um, uh, papyri site. Raffaella um, created a very detailed study of schools 
uh, of students and their writing materials. Um, she looked at how teachers ha were hired by parents and, and how teachers or parents often wrote letters to check up on their, their child's progress. In the introduction to her book, she writes, quote, a conspicuous part of the work of a historian is to render visible details that were hidden in the unexceptional practices of everyday life, um, digging a sort of archaeological trench in the reality of ancient education helps to helps us target the details, the, the, the material culture of education. And she says um, also that by studying these fragments that were found in the deserts of Egypt on papyrus and also on limestone and ostraca potsherds, she says that these fragments um, allows us to retrieve voices from the ancient past that are unmediated by the necessity of reaching a wider public and posterity. And it permits us to literally touch the hands of people who left traces in writing. After the death of Alexander the Great, uh, Greek became uh, the language of the administration and uh, of education in Egypt. So uh, the peasant kept on uh, speaking Egyptian, but the people, let's say, who counted uh, had to learn uh, Greek to reach some position. Here you see Alexandria, and uh, you come down uh, along uh, uh, the Nile. Here you see Ameida, and uh, on uh, the side Trimitis. This was, uh, uh, in fact, uh, this is uh, the city uh, that uh, we were uh, excavating. Um, and the remains go from uh, the um, pharaonic period. Uh, we found, for example, a beautiful stele that now is in the major museum in Cairo, um, to the fourth century AD. This magnificent uh, thing is the only other example of a school uh, besides ours that uh, is uh, available. Serenos uh, uh, was uh, a counselor of the city. Uh, he was important, he received uh, uh, dignitaries, and I mean, uh, the, the men uh, who counted uh, in the oasis, uh, and uh, 
in his uh, triclinium, uh, like uh, the place uh, where they ate but also received people, he surrounded himself uh, um, with uh, many uh, images from Homer. This is a kind of magical room because the students were sitting here, they looked, uh, and I'll show you better uh, the verses that are here, they looked at almost like a blackboard. All uh, uh, the walls were covered uh, um, in uh, some kind of a white coating so that uh, people could write, uh, and then uh, with water and a sponge, uh, they could uh, uh, erase. The unusual thing about this text is also that you have a god up there, may the god grant my wishes, and the god cannot be Hermes, because, so there is a possibility. Since uh, here we are at the very beginning of the 4th century AD, that we are talking about the Christian uh, God. Uh, because uh, at that point, uh, many um, Christian teachers kept on using uh, the Greek system of education, uh, the pagan gods uh, and everything. We spent months trying to understand uh, what this was. And the reason uh, was uh, uh, that uh, uh, if it were poetry or prose, it would have been uh, written in what we called uh, a book hand kind of orderly with the letters uh, a little bit separated. Here we have a very cursive text. And so some people said, oh, maybe this was a receipt of something. But I thought, come on. I mean, in the school, a receipt. I always suspected uh, that uh, uh, some students did not uh, learn uh, everything, the syllabaries, but they just wrote to practice their hands. And here you see on the top the teacher who writes a maxim, and the student copies it. But then uh, he keeps on copying it. But instead of copying, from the teacher writing, he keeps on copying from his own text. So once you arrive at the bottom, it's a disaster. <laughs> this one is a masterpiece because it's a letter of a student who writes to his father, um, the father had sent him to Alexandria, uh, to learn uh, rhetoric, together with two other um, brothers. And everything appears uh, to have happened uh, from this letter. People had said uh, to the father, your children are actually growing long hair. So <laughs> clearly it wasn't, they didn't like it. Then. Uh, the student said, OK, Dad, I was sent here to learn rhetoric, but there are no, absolutely no teachers. Uh, all the teachers are completely incompetent. <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, uh, scholars have jumped on this and said, but not true. There were so many. <laughs> And also, they beat up a slave. Uh, anyway, <laughs> lots of <laughs> stuff. Uh, so this letter, even just in translation, uh, is absolutely marvelous. The text said uh, that Helen mixed uh, this potion 
that she calls uh, Nepenthes, that uh, uh, makes you forget uh, all uh, um, your pain and your sorrows. Scholar said probably opium because, uh, but uh, the thing is uh, that uh, I published the text uh, and uh, somebody in the internet uh, picked it up uh, and uh, talked a little bit of my article, uh, but put a title uh, that was Drugs on a School Wall. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot imagine. I received phone calls. <laughs> it became viral. If you want to know more about Professor Cribiori, check out her faculty page. If you want to know more about the Classics Department at UH Manoa, check out the website page for that department. As we always say, history is so important to help us understand the world today. Once in a while, wouldn't it be a great idea to take a look at the ancient classics? And now let's take a look at our Think Tech calendar of events going forward. There's so much happening in Hawaii. Sometimes things happen under the radar and we don't hear much about them, but Think Tech will take you there. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. To stay current on what's happening in government, industry, academia, and communities around the islands and the world. Think Tech broadcasts its daily talk shows live on the internet from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show, or if you want to replay or share our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. The audio is on thinktechhawaii.com slash audio. And we post podcasts of all our shows on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links, or sign up on our email list to get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. Think Tech is a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to join our live audience or participate in our shows, write to shows at thinktechhawaii.com. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives together in these islands and in this country. We want to stay in touch with you, and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. 
Let's think together. And yes, you can call in to our talk shows live. While you're watching any of our shows, you can call into 808-374-2014 and pose a question or participate in the discussion. And now here's this week's Think Tech commentary. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is my commentary. Trump's declaration of an emergency puts us in a constitutional crisis. Under the Constitution, Congress does the spending. Congress already refused to appropriate money for his wall. Trump is ignoring Congress, going around Congress, and thus the Constitution. We should not worry that the precedent he is trying to set by this phony emergency will allow the Democrats to do the same thing later. We should rather worry that if Trump gets away with it, he will do it again and again, phony emergencies on everything, allowing him to dictate the laws and the government. With the indefensible and continuing help of Mitch McConnell, Trump has already marginalized the government by compromising the Republican Party and the Senate, by appointing and immediately confirming hundreds of right-wing judges in the federal courts, by failing to make appointments and appointing unqualified leaders to federal agencies, and by undermining the intelligence agencies in our country. This dangerous crossroads is hauntingly reminiscent of the Enabling Act of 1933 in Germany, when Hitler ended the Reichstag by having them pass a bill to allow him to make all the laws. The rest is history. If the courts, and especially the Supreme Court, permit Trump to declare a national emergency without there being an emergency, and Congress does not stop him, Congress will again have abdicated. The balance of power among the branches of government designed by the founders will be corrupted, and democracy as we have known it will be upended in favor of this boorish pretender. Putin must be dancing. His efforts to manipulate public opinion and our elections by active measures and disinformation are working very well. Trump has been helping him by fomenting irreconcilable, hostile conflicts on politics, race, religion, health care, climate change, international trade, environment, education, taxes, abortion, gun control, special programs and infrastructure, and more. And in undermining NATO and our critical diplomatic relations with long-standing allies. Putin must be ecstatic to see Trump, his fawning follower, throw our sacred constitution to the wolves. Putin seems to own Trump. Lord and Mueller know what Putin has on him, but it must be big. For us, a continuation of Trump's machinations can lead only to a national breakdown and ultimately political and economic domination by Russia and or China, or for that matter, global war. Sadly, we may already have passed the point of no return. See how much time we waste on Trump and his daily distractions, and how little time we have left to think together and save ourselves from what he is doing. As a country, we seem more and more unfocused and unable to deal with him. This makes him all the more powerful. What's the solution? What can we individually and collectively do? Well, we shouldn't fall into the web of divisiveness. We shouldn't be complacent about his lies and distortions of the truth and his ruthless attacks on the media and those who criticize him. Above all, we should not take the bait and fight among ourselves. We cannot let Trump divide us. The Democrats can't afford fragmentation on non-critical issues. We need to focus. We should come together to get Trump out of office. We should form and support a national alliance to choose and elect someone else who can resist his provocations and repair the wreckage of his unhinged administration. I'm glad Hawaii joined the suit to stop Trump's declaration of emergency, just as I was glad that Hawaii joined the suit to stop his travel ban. Hawaii needs to be a leader, morally, socially, and politically, here and in Washington and across the country. We should be part of this national effort. We should make our views known across the country and the world. We should connect the dots on Trump. We should point out the error of his ways and the damage of his actions. We should resist anything as would enable him to continue his efforts to achieve unrestrained power. If that means writing or disseminating op-ed pieces, then so be it. If that means contributing to candidates in other states, then so be it. If that means talking with or going to the mainland to participate in their campaigns, then so be it. 
We are here with the advantage of distance and diversity, and we need to contribute to the national conversation and show Congress, and particularly the Senate, how much we the people around the country care and how much we the people want our elected officials to do their sworn duty to uphold the law. Ben Franklin said we can only have a republic if we're willing to keep it. Right now, this republic is in greater jeopardy than it has ever been. If we don't act together to restore constitutional government in Washington, we will all be very sorry. To keep the republic, we must all pay the price, just as they did in 1789. Freedom doesn't come free. The price is eternal vigilance against the terrible, villainous tomfoolery we are now seeing under Donald Trump. Time to stand up. What were you doing when the country came apart, Daddy? I hope you can give your kids a good answer. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech, but first we want to thank our underwriters. That wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Elise does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the study of ancient education in Egypt. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important Think Tech episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Elise Anderson. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.